Who, who am I blaming? Who am I blaming for this, people? Okay, uh, we're live. It is the first time ever, a full four minutes late, and I feel ashamed. We had a mic issue. We had to reboot a computer, uh, upload another browser thingy. Anyways, now it looks like it's working very well. So, everybody, uh, first things first, you may notice more wrinkles in my face and more gray hair. I'm using a new camera, which was a gift. And it's supposed to be an upgrade from the previous camera. So let me know what you think of the video quality. The mic is still my blue snowball. Uh, but I have also upgraded a mic. And so the next podcast, once I can get everything up and connected and figure it out, should be impeccable audio. Uh, tonight, today, we're talking with Maxime Bernier. So Maxime Bernier, for those of you who don't know, is the leader of the People's Party of Canada. We're going to get into the history, the origins of it, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to take as many questions as we can get in the chat that we don't answer in our stream. Uh, and this is going to be interesting because I reached out to Maxime. I, I don't know how I make the how he reached out anymore, but um, I, I was interested in meeting with him. I was interested in talking with him, seeing what politics is about, especially seeing what's going on in Canada right now. Uh, so it's going to be it's going to be an interesting discussion. We might do some in French, and then I'm going to do like an immediate translation. Just you know, I think we might have more of a Quebec contingency to this stream proportionately than other streams. Um, but that's it. I, I don't think we're going to have too much trouble keeping up with the super chats in the chat. I may not bring them up because it might be a little distracting, but I'm going to screenshot them, take the questions, and and bring them up as much as I can. Okay. With that said, without further ado, I think. I want to see one thing before we go. I want to see how many people we have here. Okay, 688. YouTube has not been good on notifications. It has not been good on uh, a lot of things lately. We got our first super chat. I'm going to take a screenshot. And then we're going to get into the discussion with Maxim. <sighs> okay, let's go. And by the way, this is not going to be uh, just for the purposes of endorsing Maxim. It's not an endorsement. Uh, I have some tough questions for Maxime. He knows it because you can't have an interview without asking the honest, tough questions. And we're going to get to know him and people will come to their own conclusions because something tells me what we've been seeing in the media may or may not be entirely accurate, might have some footholds in reality, but may have climbed well over the fence. Without further ado, people, let us bring in, apparently his nickname is Mad Max, which I just recently I learned. Accurate, might have some footholds in reality, but may oh, have climbed well over the fence. Maxime, you might want to turn off the... Uh, okay, I think you turned it off. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Maxime, premièrement, ça va bien? Yes, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be with you. This is going to be interesting. Full disclosure for everybody watching. I met and had coffee with Maxime just off the cuff a little while ago. So no prepping, no nothing. But I wanted to you know, meet, some, meet Maxime before we did this. Um, Maxime, let's start... I don't know who, who's going to know you and who's not going to know you. Let's start a little bit from the beginning, and then we'll get into it quickly. Who are you? Where are you from? Childhood, upbringing, and how did you get into politics? Yes, first of all, you know, um, I decided to uh, jump into politics, if I may say, say that, in 2006. But before that, I was uh, working in Montreal in the financial sector, I worked for the National Bank and also uh, I was VP of an insurance uh, corporation uh, here in Montreal. And I'm in Montreal right now. Uh, and I decided after a meeting with uh, Stephen Harper in 2006, uh, uh, Mr. Harper was looking at that time for candidates in Quebec. And uh, the time was good for me. And my dad was MP under uh, Brian Maroney. My dad was elected the first time in 1984, uh, 1988 re-elected, and 1993 re-elected as an independent. So my dad um, was very well known in Beauce, and that's my little village, saint georges de beauce It's about an hour south of Quebec City, uh, near the border of the state of Maine. It's a, a, a riding that is half rural, half urban, the biggest city over there is saint georges de beauce with 35,000 people. So I decided to go back in Beauce in 2006 uh, and to um, try to be elected uh, with the Conservative, and I was uh, successful. So uh, first time minister in 2006, uh, I was industry minister. 
after that foreign affair minister uh, after that i resigned i was a member of parliament uh, without any portfolio for a couple of years back to cabinet after that as a minister for uh, small business and tourism and also uh, minister um, for uh, agriculture and uh, as you may know like uh, in 2015 uh, Harper resigned after the election and we had the leadership I decided to uh, be a candidate for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada and I did run uh, at that time I didn't win with 49% of the vote uh, and so I tried to we had a very strong uh, platform based on four principles individual freedom personal responsibility respect and fairness and uh, you know it was very popular i had 49 percent i tried to uh, uh, ask the establishment of the conservative party of canada and i did it and also in russia at that time to take some of our ideas uh, for the, the platform for the next election but uh, after uh, 14 months uh, andrew shea was very uh, honest with me he said maxim we won't take any of your ideas and knowing that these ideas were popular with the membership of the conservative party of canada so at that time i decided you know i don't want to waste my time with the conservative party i don't want to run under a platform that i don't believe in and at that time andrew Scheer was uh, trying to bring the party central left and he did it like O'Toole today and so i resigned and we created the People's Party of Canada based on the same platform that I had uh, at that time when I was running for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. Okay. Now and as I, and, and as you know, I we we created a party first year. I didn't win my riding. Uh, actually, I will be back in both for the next uh, general election. Uh, but uh, we had 1.6 percent of the vote. Uh, and I think uh, I think it's not too bad for a first year because if you look at the Green Party of Canada, it took them 20 years and six elections to have more than 1.6 percent of the vote. So we did that our, our first year, and now the party is growing, and we're looking for uh, having uh, uh, candidates in every riding at the next general election. And I think we will increase our percentage of the vote, and my goal would be to be reelected. Uh, and be back in Parliament. Okay, now I'm going to back up a little bit because, look, I, I did a little research for this, and what I quickly noticed is that very little of the media coverage of you is anything but extremely negative. It's it's negative to the point <laughs> where um, I now sort of understand what I was seeing back in 2018 in terms of media coverage. One thing that I that I uh, that I learned uh, back when you were the uh, min uh, foreign minister. Is that there was yeah. uh, there was an issue apparently about you having left uh, a, a, a briefing uh, at yeah. uh, your your I think it was your girlfriend at the time's place. It was a, yes. a confidential briefing on NATO, which led to the schism between you and the Conservative Party. Um, for for right. anybody who doesn't know what what happened, I mean, do, can you explain what happened a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I was a uh, foreign affairs minister at that time, and uh, I had a meeting in uh, for a NATO meeting in Europe. And I had a briefing a book. And when you receive a briefing book, it's all a secret uh, documents. But after the meeting, because it was part of the press conference that I did in Europe, but after the press conference, everything that I had in my briefing book was part of the press conference. So it was public after it. And so I went to my girlfriend at that time. And so um, I forgot my documents over there. And uh, a couple of months after that, uh, she uh, bring that public. And uh, I resigned because of that, uh, because and uh, there's a huge in investigation. And so uh, at the end, I think that was the best decision. Uh, I had a meeting with uh, Prime Minister Harper on uh, Monday morning, and I told him that I will resign because of that, because uh, I, I think it's important to keep the confidence uh, of the, the, the Prime Minister, and that was the thing to do. So I resigned, and at the end, um, uh, it was a tough time for me. But uh, the most important is after that, I've been reelected with 68% of the of the vote of the support in both. And uh, I was uh, I was back in cabinet a couple of years after that. So that was 
um, and I didn't know I didn't know a lot of uh, the past of my good friend at that time. Um, and so uh, what she was telling me was not actually what I learned after that. Uh, because, as you know, the journalists, um, mainstream journalists, did a lot of research on myself and on her, and uh, she was not uh, the lady that she pretended to be. But uh, that passed, and you know, yes, I did a mistake by forgetting these uh, documents over there. But you have to learn, and uh, I think uh, I learned a lot from that experience. And uh, that's why uh, when I have uh, a bad news uh, today or bad, uh, bad coverage, I must say, from the mainstream media, for me, it is not the end of the world uh, because at that time, it was a, a tough time for me. So, uh, you know, if you stick to your principles and you fight for what you believe, uh, at the end, uh, you, will, uh, you will win. And uh, that's what I believe in. That's why we created the party. And that's why, you know, uh, I'm pushing for more freedom and more personal responsibility. So, and, and I'll explain just for the audience. I mean, to say the way the media frames it is that the media framed it as you forgot a confidential NATO briefing at your girlfriend who had been under investigation. And from what I understand, from what I've read, the investigations predated any of this. But the way the media packages it sounds like it all happened at the same time that you were dating <laughs> so you know yeah. married to the mob type thing so i mean it's interesting uh, there's the expression let he or she who is out without sin cast the first stone mistakes happen and uh i think it's interesting to hear from you your side versus what ran wild in the media and what still runs wild in the media um okay so that, that's i mean that's interesting now the other thing that the media consistently depicts you and the party as um and I, I might miss a few racist, xenophobic, uh, nationalist, anti-immigrant, anti-science, <laughs> to name a few. So now, th th this is these are the catchphrases, what I'm noticing, because I've gotten some of them is, these are the catchphrases for anybody who's right of, uh, I don't want to make any, you know, right of Mao is the expression now. Um, th they say this about everybody who's opposition. It's, you know, they said it about Bush at the time, they said it about Harper, they said it about everybody who's not liberal is that you're, you're every, all, all of the phobes. One problem is that you have some elements which uh, will allow the media to run with. So back, I think it was in 2018 or 2019, I think her name was Sybil Hogg, uh, a Nova Scotia uh, me member of the, the People's Party of Canada, who posted some statements on Twitter about uh, Islam being evil, and the PPC did not disavow, didn't sanction didn't do whatever uh, to to reprimand her for those statements, which subsequently allowed the media to run with a certain narrative or a certain story. So, I mean, the first thing is, what's the context for that? And the question I had to myself is, what could the People's Party of Canada had done in order to sanction that conduct? And why didn't it do anything? Yeah. First of all, uh, you may understand that uh, it's because of our policy. We are the only party, and at that time also, we were the only party who uh, promote uh, uh, fewer immigrants. Uh, we want to, uh, we don't believe in mass immigration and in our platform, uh, and it's still our platform today. We, uh, we want fewer immigrants and more economic immigrants. And because of that, that debate on immigration, it is, it is a new debate here in Canada. And it was easy for my opponents to say that uh, Bernier and the People's Party uh, is uh, a racist party. And, uh, and actually, that's why I'm in court. I'll be in court in Toronto in June against uh, Kinsella. Uh, he's, um, he, he, was, uh, he received a contract from the Conservative Party of Canada to discredit our party at the last campaign. And he said that I was a Nazi, a Nazi and, and a ra racist. And so I can tell you that I will win my case. Uh, we have <laughs> a very strong, strong case based on the reality. And I'm suing him for $350,000. Uh, and we will have that case public. I think we'll be in court in the beginning of June. So it was important for me to uh, sue him personally uh, because it, that's my reputation, but also that has a huge, huge impact on the reputation of the uh, People's Party of Canada. And I can tell you during the last campaign, we had people in Toronto, in, in BC, that uh, were running for us uh, from a different fate, 
Jewish, uh, uh, Muslim, uh, uh, from different uh, ethnicity. And, uh, and for them, they were knocking at door and pe some people were saying, you know, oh no, I don't want to vote for the racist party. And uh, I think uh, Kinsella and the Conservative Party of Canada were a little more efficient to uh, discredit us. And so that's why I'm su suing him right now. And, uh, but I must tell you that after the last election, I had uh, a conversation with uh, Preston Manning. Preston Manning created the Reform uh, Party of Canada, a party based in the beginning in Western Canada in the 1990s. And he told me after the last election, he said, Maxime, my opponents did the same, th same thing to me at my first election. They were saying that I was a racist and, uh, and all that. Uh, it was uh, at, at the second election. Uh, it was not in the news anymore because it was not true. And he said, you had a tough election, the first one for the BBC. But I'm pretty sure the next one, uh, it won't be a discussion because it's not true. So I think that's important to, uh, to say that. And I'm asking people go on our website at peoplespartyofcanada.ca and have a look to our platform. You'll see that uh, we are doing politics differently. We don't try to please to everybody. We're doing politics based on principles and we have a coherent platform based on these, on these uh, four principles, individual freedom, personal responsibility, respect and fairness. And so our immigration policy right now, I think it's important to have people who are, who, who, uh, wants to come here that will uh, share our values and uh, and it's something important if we want them to be part of the uh, Canadian society it's easier when you have an, a job to integrate our society so that's why we want uh, more economic immigrants and a little bit less of reunification of family so we have a, a platform on immigration that is different than the other political parties and I think it's important for the future of this country because we like that country we want that country to be like that in 10 20 uh, five years so that's why it's time to have a discussion and coming from Quebec we always had that discussion on immigration in Quebec uh, as you know Quebec is the only uh, francophone part in uh, in North America and it's important for Quebecers to keep their culture and their their language and so immigration, it's always part of a debate. Actually, the, the premier in Quebec right now, um, had a, when he was running for being premier, he said, you know, we must reduce uh, immigration by 20%. Uh, and, and so that, and nobody said that he was a racist. Uh, so we need to have that debate uh, for the future of this country. And this party uh, will speak about immigration and other important subjects, uh, cancel culture, free speech, uh, during the next campaign. It, it's an amazing thing, actually, because when I was looking into this and <clears throat> they describe you as xenophobic anti-immigrant, where, uh, from what I understood, your policy was you wanted to reduce immigration from 300,000 a year to 100,000 a year. Um, between 100, one, between 100 and 150,000 a year. That was our platform at the last campaign, yes. Will it will it change for the next uh, campaign? What we just said now, because of the uh, the difficult time, we said we must have a moratorium on immigration until you know Canadians will find job. I think it's important. So uh, because of the lockdowns and, and the recession that we had, it's coming a little bit better right now. But we said during a recession, we must think to have a moratorium on immigration and coming back on these numbers after that, because the goal is for sh we 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 want Canadians to be able to have a job. And so that's that's the most important. This party is focused on uh, Canada first and helping Canadian first, like on our platform. We want to uh, uh, we don't want to spend the same money that uh, Trudeau is spending right now on foreign aids. We think that it's more important to help Canadians. We don't think it's it's the role of the federal government to spend money in Africa to build roads and, and fighting climate change over there. We must bring back that money here at home in Canada. So answering your question, uh, the next campaign, uh, depending when would be the campaign, if we are still in a recession, it would be a moratorium. If not, it would be the same number that we had before. All right. And, and, and someone said in the chat that I'm looking at my texts. I'm not looking at my texts. I actually wanted to pull up one of your tweets where, you know, not, not, to, not to defend you. It's just that when, when 
the media mentions that you're xenophobic and anti diversity. And one of your tweets is from 2018, which says Trudeau keeps pushing his diversity is our strength slogan. Yes, Canada is a huge and diverse country. This diversity is part of us and should be celebrated. But where do we draw the line? I mean, the, the media is amazing because they will take one aspect, they'll take one element of a tweet and ignore the other element that doesn't support what they want to put forward. But yeah. before, <clears throat> the, 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 when, when things like with Sybil Hogg happen, I mean, exp explain Explain what happened with Sybil Hogg, what the PPC could have done, what they didn't do, do to sanction, to punish, and whether or not, you know, you would have done anything differently today than back then. Because, you know, that was very clear at that time. That's what she said. Uh, you know, she uh, excused herself and uh, she did that. Uh, and so uh, after saying that uh, in front of the media, uh, you know, she uh, did a mistake, and um, and we and she she acknowledged that. So that's why you know everybody can do a mistake in life. And I don't believe in cancel culture. I don't believe in canceling people. So uh, that's uh, that was the idea behind all that. Okay, I mean, fair, I mean, fair enough. We'll see what people think. The the other issue is people take to Twitter and they say things in inflammatory, you know, in inflammatory ways things that other people say in more eloquent ways. And you know, she she definitely, I saw her subsequent tweets, she walked it back because I think one tweet is indefensible and then some of the discussion is, is, is a legitimate discussion. How you choose to have it is another issue. Twitter is just not the place for nuanced discussion. It leads to one tweet that destroys a person's reputation and potentially a party's reputation. Uh, is, is For everybody out there, is she still, uh, how does it work? Is she still a member of the PPC? I think so. Uh, I, I think so. But, you know, uh, we uh, actually right now we are uh, uh, calling for candidates. Uh, in the election can be soon. And what we do, uh, we have a contract with an independent firm. They will do a background check on our uh, future candidates, a social media check also. So we will. Uh, we want to be sure that the, the people that will represent the PPC at the next election share our values. And But if somebody did a mistake in the past, uh, you know, we will look at it and have a discussion with that person. So <clears throat> right now we are looking for candidates and I don't know if she'll be a, a candidate or if she applied to be a candidate for the next election. We'll see. All right. And now, interesting enough, you're talking to <laughs> 1,600 people. I would imagine majority Quebec or Canadian. Uh, how do people go about submitting a candidacy to the PPC if they want? Yeah, they just have to go on the website. There's a process over there. And so there's a questionnaires. And and uh, after that, you know, they will receive a call from uh, our head office. They will have to do an interview by Zoom. And uh, if uh, we approve the candidate, we will give that name to the riding. I don't know if a person wants to run a downtown Montreal in Pepino, for example. Uh, we will approve that candidate. And after that, if there's two candidates in Pepino, we'll have a nomination. And, you know, it's an open process. Uh, and uh, everybody can run when they, uh, they, they've been approved by the head office after that process. Okay. Puis, Maxime, je vous ai dit que j'allais vous poser quelques questions en français. Puis, je vais oui. les traduire par la suite en temps réel. Il y avait eu une question, un super chat, comme on, comme on l'appelle sur YouTube. C'était en français, donc je vais le poser maintenant. Ça vient de Payne Cabal One. Mad Max, est-ce que vous approuvez de forcer les conseils de bande à dévoiler ce qu'ils font avec les fonds publics et combattre la corruption première nation? And first of all, what I just said in, in English was, I said I'm going to ask Max a question in French, translate it in English. This question here was, Max, are you going to, are you going to um, approve of forcing banned councils, uh, First Nations banned councils, to divulge or disclose what they do with public funds to combat corruption. La réponse est oui, absolument oui. D'ailleurs, en tant que député du Parti conservateur, j'ai voté pour une loi pour la transparence. Cette loi-là, malheureusement, lorsque le gouvernement Trudeau est, est arrivé au pouvoir, ils ont aboli cette loi. So the answer is yes, absolutely. We believe in more transparency and accountability. And actually, I voted for a legislation that was just doing that under the upper government. But when uh, the Trudeau government uh, became in power, they just uh, abolished uh, what we did before. Okay, now I'm going to get into some more questions that I have. I think we've gotten 
let's just say the the, the dirt out of the way. The PPC, <laughs> uh, you know, has gotten bad press. Um, but like someone else mentioned to me, uh, another Canadian YouTuber, JJ McCullough, said, you know, rightly noted, you got on the debate stage during the last federal elections, which was quite an accomplishment. Or I don't know if it's good fortune, good luck, or an accomplishment that you got on with 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 one and a half percent. I think you were polling at the time, uh, so you got some good exposure. Um, although you, then you know the negative press comes in. Okay, I mean, what's going on with the Conservative Party today? Uh, I, I I I I'm saying it loud and clear. I'm neither conservative nor liberal. I voted both at one point in my life. I voted neither at at one point in my life as well. I have seen Harper. And I've seen Aaron O'Toole, and I don't, uh, you know, from what I understand of the Conservative Party, I'm looking at Aaron O'Toole, and I'm not, he looks to be more liberal than Trudeau at this point. Do you know what, what is going on with Aaron O'Toole, what type of candidate he is, and whether he's having some seismic shift in his, in his policies in, recent, in the recent year? Yeah, I think, David, you're right, saying that Aaron O'Toole is like uh, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals right now. That's their strategy. They did the same thing with uh, Andrew Scheer. You know, their goal is to have more support in the big GTA in, in, in Toronto uh, and also in, uh, in BC and Quebec. And, uh, you know, they, they're looking at the poll right now and they don't want to fight the mainstream media. So if you look at the platform of Aaron O'Toole and the Liberals, it's about the same on the very important policies for this country. Uh, Aaron O'Toole ran on a platform when he was uh, trying to be the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, a true conservative blue platform. And, uh, and 24 hours after that, he said in a press conference that his goal is to split the liberal, the liberal vote. So, uh, and he wants to do it to have more support, support in Eastern Canada. So that's why on climate change, you have the same platform, carbon pricing, the, the conservatives and the liberals believe in that, uh, not balancing the budget and more spending. O'Toole said that he will balance the budget in 10 years. 10, year, 10 years, it's more than three mandates. So it's like Trudeau. Uh, I think he believed that the budget would balance itself, but it won't. So uh, on the equalization formula, that it's not fair for Quebec and for Alberta, uh, O'Toole doesn't want to do anything about that. So as answering your questions, O'Toole and Trudeau on policy size, they are the same. I think Aaron O'Toole was uh, wearing a mask when he was running, a blue mask when he was running to be the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. And now we know the real Aaron O'Toole. So that's why I'm saying the PPC now is the only real true conservative uh, uh, and fiscal responsible political party in Canada. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna bring this chat up just so I can read it. It says, as a physicist from Patrick Labelle, I can see how climate change hysteria is full of holes. I hope the PPC can prepare some talking points showing the irrationality behind the CO2 madness would be happy to help for free. Submit your candidacy, Maxim. We have a, is, 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 send an email to Maxim. You can get his info online. I'm gonna ask a stupid question before I, <laughs> I, I know it's stupid before I ask it. <laughs> There's no chance you go back to the Conservative Party or they absorb you as a candidate, potentially? Is the rupture uh, irreparable? Uh, absolutely. You know, there's no change. Uh, you know, when I quit, I said this party is morally and intellectually corrupt. And I was right. We have a lot of exemplar, example uh, from from that now with Aaron O'Toole and also with uh, uh, Andrew Scheer when he was a leader. So, no, I won't go back. And when I said we're doing politics differently, it's important to understand that. Uh, usually a political party or a politician will speak about something when they will have maybe 30% or 35% support in the poll on one idea or one policy. For us, that's the contrary. We believe that we have the best ideas and the best platform for uh, the future of our country, a more prosperous and free country. So if there's only five or 10 people or 20 people in favor of a, a, a policy, we will speak more about that policy to be sure to have more support because we believe that that's the best thing for the country. Like uh, ending the lockdowns, you know, about 70% uh, of the population uh, um, is happy with, with the lockdowns and curfew that we have. But uh, a minority are questioning that and we are. You know, it's against our freedom and we must question that it's doing more harms th than good. So so 
we 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 don't we we know that the mainstream media uh, is one hundred percent on the other side, uh, and we have a risk to have bad press saying that. But it's too important for for our economy, for our health, to to have that policy, and that's why I was part of the uh, end the lockdowns uh, caucus with other uh, former member of parliament and and, and actually a, a member of parliament at the provincial and uh, federal levels also, also. So so we are different than the conservative and I believe strongly that we are the only conservative party in Canada right now. So, so someone asked me a question uh, via a Patreon chat. Uh, Patreon's another platform, but whatever. And he sent me an email. The, the question he asked was, would you undertake or are you going to run candidates uh, west of Quebec that would compete with the Maverick Party of Ontario and potentially make it more difficult for the Maverick Party to gain to gain some uh, some following? Yeah, so so for your viewers, uh, David, it's important to say that the Maverick Party is a party in, in Western Canada. They want to run candidates in BC, Alberta, and uh, Saskatchewan. So that's important, only in uh, that region. And and their, their platform is simple. They have two tracks. First of all, the Maverick wants to have a triple E Senate. And uh, if they are not able to have that, it's the separation. So that's the two tracks. And um, uh, and yes, we can be in a, a little bit in competition against the Maverick Party. Uh, but for us, we will run candidate all across the country in every riding in this country. I must admit that if we have the election this spring, uh, it can be a little bit challenging for us. But if the next general election at the federal level, it's uh, next um, next uh, fall, uh, I strongly, strongly believe that we'll have a full slate of candidates. So that being said, I was actually in uh, in uh, Alberta last weekend and I delivered a speech about that and you can read uh, my speech on the the PPC website, peoplespartyofcanada.ca and I said, you know, at people out west, don't waste your time to vote for a triple E Senate because the reason for them to have the triple E Senate in their mind is to have maybe a, a more powerful federal government that will be uh, more because if there's a triple E Senate, it's a Senate that will have the, you know, uh, uh, Atlantic provinces will have the same number of seats than other provinces. It will be triple E equal, uh, elected uh, and efficient. So I, I said, you know, we don't need that. You need the federal government to respect you and you need the federal government to respect the constitution. So don't waste your time because for a triple E Senate, they will need to have a constitutional amendment and it will be impossible. Quebec will always want to have uh, the, the number of senators that they have right now. And, and I think, you know, we, we must look at Ottawa, not for Ottawa to be stronger, but to be less, uh, less stronger. Uh, and we want a radical decentralization. That's what I said out West. I said, we can have a radical decentralization, respecting provincial jurisdiction, and the autonomy of provinces without having a federal government that interfere in your day-to-day -day life. So that's the solution. Don't waste your time for the Maverick because the Triple E won't come. It's impossible. We need to have a, a constitutional amendment and it, it, it won't be impossible to do. So that being said, you have the separation. And I, I, I was in Alberta and I can tell you that if you look at the poor right now in Alberta, there's about 35% of Albertans that uh, want uh, that want to be uh, independent so it's it's a strong movement over there and that's why i said there's a western alienation right now but the conservative party of canada the liberal party of canada they are not speaking about that and i i told them if you want to have a new country you must work at the provincial level first like the pq in quebec and, and you know elect a government that that uh, uh, wants to have uh, the separation and the independence and, and that government will have to do a referendum and so but before being independent you will have to vote at the federal level and we we have the solution for you out west and for all the country we believe in pipelines we are ready to use the constitution the section 
9210 to be sure that we'll be able to build pipelines in this country. We we won't sign the Paris Accord. We won't impose a, a carbon tax on provinces. So we have a platform that is good for Alberta, but also for every province in our country. And, and that speech was very well received. So the Maverick Party won't go anywhere with their triple E Senate. And if you believe in the separation and you're a Westerner, vote at the vote for the Wild Rose Independent Party at the provincial level. But at the same time, you know, we we can do something in Canada uh, with the platform that we have at the People's Party of Canada. Okay, that's 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 good info. I think it's going to be new info to a lot of people. Um, and now, just coming back to one thing. Uh, uh, something you said earlier, the PPC is the only federal party that is uh, anti-lockdown, or at least uh, wants the lockdown lifted somewhat. Yeah. Are they? Uh, what's what's the position? On, uh, it's a question someone asked on mandatory vaccines. Yeah. No. We first of all, uh, everybody must be free to decide if they want a vaccine or, or not, a and that would be free in a free society. So we're against mandatory vaccine. Uh, and you know, personally, I'm not an anti-vaccine. Uh, I had a vaccine before, but uh, for me personally, I think that we m must not impose. Uh, mandatory vaccine to our population. Uh, you know, people are, are, are free and responsible and uh, they must be able to decide if they want a vaccine or not. Well, okay. And, and I'll, we'll compare that to what Justin Trudeau just said during a CPAC speech today. But um, what about a, a vaccine passport? What I find amazing is um, François Legault started off one way a year or two ago when he got, I don't know how long he got elected ago, has become something totally different and now is talking about a Quebec vaccine passport. And Trudeau, the government, from what I understood at the time, was anti-vaccine uh, passport. And now you have uh, Hajdu, Hajdu, sorry, talking about a vaccine passport. What's, what's, what's the PPC's position on a vaccine passport? You, you, don't, you don't have to have the vaccine, but if you don't get it, you can't travel as much. No, no, we will fight that, you know, uh, like we are fighting uh, lock lockdowns right now. We will fight that uh, and we don't need a vaccine and we don't we don't want and we don't need also a passport for that. Uh, it's about our freedom. People must be free to travel uh, across the country and, and, and in and out the country. Uh, also, we are fighting the uh, um, uh, current uh, hotel, uh, hotel uh, mandatory... Court, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 mandatory for Canadians when they are coming uh, coming from another country. Uh, it, it's against our constitution. A and speaking about that, I think if people are interested, they can go to the uh, Justice Center for um, uh, for our freedom. Justice, I, I don't Justice, Justice Center for constitutional freedoms. And incidentally, Maxime, yeah. merci pour uh, le heads up. Ce jeudi, je vais faire une autre entrevue avec John Carpe concernant le yeah. pasteur James Coates qui est emprisonné en Alberta. This Thursday, everybody, uh, John Carpe has said he's going to come back on the show and we're going to talk about Pastor Coates and the update and get the details on that. So sorry to interrupt there, but Thursday. But, but I must say, David, uh, I, I, I had... Um... Uh, I had the opportunity to have a briefing about what they're doing right now and what John is doing. And it, I can tell you, it would be very interesting for your viewers. And, and, and John is fighting these lockdowns. The economy must be open. People must be able to go to, ch to church. The business must be able to reopen. So, uh, and he's doing, he's suing the government actually uh, in court uh, and with a strong, uh, um, evidence and strong proof so it would be uh, very interesting to to see but the the other side the, the negative side on on that it can take as you know you're a lawyer it can take years before having a decision so in the meantime uh, uh, we must act and as a political party and that's why i'm part of end the lockdowns caucus we have people uh, uh, who are a member of the Legislative Assembly uh, in Alberta, a member of the Provincial Parliament in Ontario, uh, people who are uh, elected at the federal level, people who are elected at their uh, uh, municipality level that are part of that uh, and the Lockdowns National Caucus. And all together we try to fight that and explain to the population that, you know, we must stop all that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hurting the population. 
and, and our economy at the same time. Uh, have you done any, had any people do research to get the stats on what percentage of the population in your political research supports the lockdowns and supports mandatory vaccines, mandatory face masks? Is it, from what you understand, a majority of Canada? I, I think, you know, we didn't do any survey. We don't do politics based on survey or polling. So, uh, but I'm looking at the public uh, survey uh, and there's a, there's a majority in favor of all that. So, but you, you must understand for the last year, uh, the, the budget of the federal and provincial governments uh, are huge. And I must say, it's not a communication budget. It is more a propaganda budget. Uh, and you know you're listening to the news and and, and also the media are are, are not um, are giving only one version of all that since uh, the beginning of that uh, virus and uh, I can understand that you have a majority in favor of what the, the provincial government and the federal government uh, are doing right now so we need to to be out there and to uh, you know there's other medical experts that are saying the same thing that uh, what we said you know we must end that uh, and we know who to protect it's uh, seniors uh, people in a seniors uh, uh, home so we must protect them first and, and and we know that if you if you have the virus the chance to to uh, not die from the virus it's 99% so yes the virus is there but uh, I was very pleased to see what happened in the U.S., in Texas, in, in uh, Florida, and other uh, states in the U.S. that now their economy is free, there's no mandatory mask, and they're back to business. We need to do that as soon as possible in Canada, and that's the goal of the ends the, the lockdowns uh, caucus. It's, it's, it's amazing. People don't fully appreciate, or maybe they do, but I get messages from across the world, and I got you know a, a message uh, of a picture from Tel Aviv, what it looks like in Tel Aviv, what it looks like in uh, the Philippines. I got someone sending me a, a video in real time. They're eating out, eating dinner. Florida, Texas, we all know what's happening. And meanwhile, in Canada, it just seems to be going the other direction and much quicker where you, li you literally, I mean, I don't, I don't care if you're left or right, but when you have Justin Trudeau saying quite literally, people want to have a constitutional conversation and I'm just not engaging in that right now, uh, it means nothing less than what it, what it means verbatim. And it's a good segue to this question. How do you plan to protect civil rights in Canada, especially when the Supreme Court seems willing to cur curtail them for any reasonable idea? And actually, before we even get there, in Quebec, I've covered it, a Gatineau judge you know, said, the, the curfew measures are presumed to be constitutional. In order to overturn them, you have to show uh, I, I, a very serious immediate harm and rebut the presumption of constitutionality. The way John Carpe is doing it through the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms is on a different uh, threshold for overturning the, the validity of a law, but it takes a lot longer to get there. So, I mean, what what is the PPC doing to protect rights and what can they do given their minimal uh, minimal size and I guess minimal influence in politics? Yeah, but I think I must admit that right now we have more support than we had before on that question. Uh, you know, I started to speak against lockdowns uh, early, uh, I think it was six or eight months ago. I did videos about it and I explained that. So we need to be out there. And uh, I want to thank you, uh, David, for giving me that opportunity to speak about our platform to your viewers. But the more people, and I'm asking people, you know, don't, 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 don't uh, be shy. You can speak to your, uh, to your neighbors, to your colleagues, and, and express your point of view about all that. We need to have that discussion. Right now, we don't have that discussion, so it's very hard. And we don't have a huge uh, uh, propaganda budget like the, the provincial government here in Quebec. But, you know, uh, step by step, I think, you know, the, the, the population at the end, uh, I think they're, they're, they're tired of all that and they understand the more we are out there, the more we, we can uh, protest together or doing some uh, manifestation. I think it's important. It's important because, you know, we may be a minority right now, but uh, if you look at the data, if you look at the science, we are on the right side of the issue. We just have to be out there to explain that uh, the issue, we are on the right side uh, legally because it's against our constitution for sure. Uh, 
Uh, also, uh, if you look at uh, a lot of medical experts, they are saying, you know, we don't need that to uh, fight the virus. So uh, medically, we, uh, we are on the right side of the issue also. We need to speak and people, some people are afraid to speak. That's why we are asking uh, leaders who are elected at the provincial level or municipal level to, to be with us and, and, and to speak about it. I was very, uh, very happy and very proud that uh, a mayor from my former riding in Bose uh, stood up and said, you know, it, it, we must stop all these lockdowns and reopen the gym, uh, the schools, the churches, and, and going back to real life. So there's, a, there's, no, uh, there's no easy answer. Uh, how to fight the mainstream media, but uh, the more we'll be out there, the more we'll speak about that, the more videos like that about that subject, it will help. And so that's what we are doing. But at the same time, I must admit that we are the only political party at the federal level who is against the lockdowns. All the others, they want to follow the majority and because they think that will be they will be elected if they are saying the same thing that the majority wants to hear but uh, that's not the way we are doing politics uh, and that must end and sooner will be better no no it's amazing when i saw aaron o'toole uh tweet how could justin trudeau think about calling an election during a pandemic i was like are you trying to get him reelected because i i think I, I think there happens to be a larger silent majority out there i talked to you know friends family, neighbors, and I talk to people who are overtly silent or, you know, uh, supporting these measures and privately uh, are fed up with them and, 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 and not just fed up from a personal perspective, see what's going on elsewhere in the world and are learning. And it's a, you say, you know, I, I, I'm giving you, a, you thank me for giving you a platform. I don't think I'm giving you a platform. I just like to hear the other side talk. I would love to have Francois Legault come on here. He, he would never do it in a million yeah. years. Or Horatio Arruda. I would love to have them come on and explain themselves where I, you know, I would ask them questions and I'm sure that they would ask for all my questions in advance, whereas people who are open for free discussion don't, like yourself. And I can ask you the unpleasant questions and I can hear what you have to say on other issues. Um, but when you say we're on the right side of science, I would love to have Horatio Arruda come on and explain the recommendation for a curfew when he himself you know, acknowledged that it doesn't help to stop the spread of a virus, where by most accounts, the idea of telling people they can't go out and do the things that they would otherwise do at night, uh, at night because of the curfew, it forces them out during the day. And so they even acknowledged it. So I, I would love to have these people on to ask them the questions, but to the person in the chat who accused me of being a conservative bias, they don't want to have these discussions with anybody but the media that is either going to ask them nice questions or has their questions already pre-drafted by them. So I, I can't control the rest of the discussion, but I like that you come on to an open question forum and not knowing what I'm going to ask you. But David, uh, that's why the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms is very important because John will be in the court. He will tell you that uh, because of that pastor that is in jail right now. It's the first uh, political prisoner that we have in Canada, but he, he, is, he will be in court in the beginning of May. And so why it's so important? Because the government will have to present the science and facts and, and they will have to justify what, what they're doing right now. They're not doing that, you're right. They're not doing that right now because the mainstream media is not asking the tough question. But in court, it won't be, uh, 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 it won't be uh, based on a press release or a press conference, they will have to have a feed of it. They will have to have science. They will have to prove it. You know, you're a lawyer. So that will be very, very interesting uh, to hear. And, and, and some of them were saying it's not based on science. So they will have well, to bring their proof in from the court and that would be very difficult for them. No, it's it'll be difficult. But the one thing is being a lawyer and nobody likes it, nobody on the right, likes hearing me say this when it comes to pastor Coates, there's going to be the legal argument that he's not being jailed imprisoned and incarcerated for breaking the law right now he's just not being released because he refuses to sign an undertaking for a bail term now some people are saying that you know the provision under which he's being held is not a law it's an ordinance and we'll talk about that with john carpe but the problem yes. is the legal side there's going to be the science to justify the laws but then there's going to be the law to justify the incarceration where 
the law is presumed uh, constitutional, and if you refuse to undertake to respect it, they're not going to release you. And it's it's an ugly technicality mm -hmm. where they can infect, and they have, call it lawfully detain someone for violating what is probably an unconstitutional ordinance in the first place. But we'll see where that yeah. goes. Um, well, let, me, yeah. let me bring this question up. It's a good one. It says, uh, Sean McDonald, greeting from the States. Where do we go from here on something like Keystone XL? Do you see? Uh, do you seek to revive the project? Trudeau seems to have given up. Viva, and I'm not going <laughs> to read the rest of that. <laughs> the Keystone Pipeline. I mean, how many jobs is Canada going to lose from the Biden administration uh, ending that project? Oh, I don't have the details, but a lot. And, and that being said, yes, we must try to do to do more for for uh, being sure that the Keys, uh, Keystone Pipeline will will revise will, will will go on. But at the end, we must admit also that it is a decision by uh, the uh, the government in the U.S. So what we want to do, we want to be sure to build pipelines across our country going east and west and we can do that so that's why i said in the beginning you know we have in our constitution the section 9210 and we use it when i'm saying we the federal government use it more than 100 times to build uh, national infrastructures all across the country starting by our railway and, and all that so we can use it to build a pipeline and if you use that section in the constitution you will be able to build pipelines because the federal government will have exclusive jurisdiction on pipelines because it's a trans uh, provincial uh, uh, infrastructures and yes maybe some province uh, can um, go in from the court to stop that but at the end we have the constitution on our side and we have some precedent from the supreme court on our side also so but o'toole when he's saying that he, he he will do his best to build pipelines, he is not going to uh, to say the reality that he must use the section 9210 because when you use a section 9210, um, at the end, you know, you can impose a pipeline on a province using that section in the constitution. But Utul is not speaking about that. So yes, the Keystone Excel pipeline, it's an important one, but we don't control that. It is, we, we can pressure the new administration, but it's their decision at the end. That's why I think we must focus in Canada and to, to build this pipeline. We, we are able to do that. And actually, some people are saying, you know, all oh, Quebecers are not in favor of pipelines. I don't believe that. The Quebec government is not in favor of pipelines because they are listening to radical environmentalists. And so, but the population in Quebec, they remember the tragedy that we had in Lac, Lac Mégantic. Lac and they know that it's safer for the population and the environment to transport oil and gas by pipelines than by truck or trains. So you can explain that to the population in Quebec. And I'm sure you'll have support in Quebec speaking like that. Yeah, and if anyone wants to have their mind blown, I mean, you just Google uh, the map of pipelines that already exist in Canada, and you'll be, as I was, somewhat surprised at the uh, extensive nature of existing pipeline in Canada. It's not uh, really something new, is one argument. The other argument is uh, you have oil leaks and Exxon Valdez and all these things, although Exxon was a boat and not a pipeline. And so by not having the pipelines, you increase boat traffic, which has its own problems. But so it's a, yeah. it's a, that is a, a complicated issue, but so Keystone looks, whatever Keystone looks like it's, it's, it's dead in the water and not uh, coming back. But it would be difficult. Uh, and, you know, speaking about pipelines, we are in 2021. I believe that we can build a pipeline that will be secure and safe. And, and you know, it, it's, it's easy. Uh, downtown Montreal, uh, the, uh, the gas that is going from the port of Montreal to the airport uh, Trudeau, it's by pipelines under the ground, <laughs> under the, the downtown Montreal. So we can have, and we have, like you just said, a lot of pipelines in this country. So it, if you believe in it, you do the fight. But Utul doesn't want to do the fight. And that's why people out west are fed up with the conservative. And, and, and I think it would be a nice opportunity for us, uh, for the PPC. I, oh, you know, I want to maybe ask you about Wexit, but m maybe afterwards. Um, I'll just bring this one up here. We need, uh, Max, we need to address the neglect of our northern territories. What do you think about extending the railway so life can be affordable for them? 
Yeah, well, why not? You know, I think that's the role of the federal government. That's why we want a federal government that will be uh, uh, working only in exclusive federal jurisdiction and not interfering in health care, education. Uh, so you can have a, a federal government that would be smaller, but that would be more efficient in their own jurisdiction. And that's it's a, juris a, a federal jurisdiction because it's interprovincial. So I think we must look at it. I, I'm, I'm open. Uh, every, uh, you know, and at the same time, I must admit, that we have a huge deficit in Ottawa, we must start by ending all these programs that Justin Trudeau and the money that Justin Trudeau is giving to businesses, to people, because of these lockdowns. So end the lockdowns and the, the, the money transfer that we don't need, let people work and live like they want. And so that will help to cut the deficit at the same time. And, and and we'll have money for the real federal jurisdiction and try to, to, to build this country for more prosperity. That can be a good idea. I'm not against that. Okay, now, now I'm going to ask you one. I know a few people have asked in the chat, what was once a term that was dubbed conspiracy theory on the internet, and in fact, it was once a forbidden word, the Great Reset, which has now... <laughs> Um, I mean, it's been, everyone knows now the World Economic Forum has has it as a principle. They've given slides on it. They have, a, they have you know, they have a discussion about it, what the world will look like in 2030. <clears throat> and a lot of people, uh, you know, believe that Trudeau and the Trudeau government are bent on this great reset of Canada. Now, I mean, first, first of all, I mean, what do you, what do you say to the, what do you say about that to people who, who believe that the Trudeau government is bent on this great reset of, of, of the economy of Canada for a global world economy? But first of all, like you just said, uh, I think that uh, great reset, it is not a secret. It is out there. It is a, a policy platform position from the World Economic Forum. Uh, and there's book about that. So, but what I must admit, uh, it is not an international organization that can um, that can uh, mandate that policy in Canada. Uh, nobody will tell uh, the government of Canada what to do. The government of Canada is sovereign, but at the same time, you're right saying that Justin Trudeau on the policy side is 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 looking. Uh, with and working with the World Economic Forum. And I think personally believe in, in all that. So so what will happen? They, they, are, they are working to change our legislation in Canada to be in line with that, starting by um, climate change. You know, there's a new bill, a Bill C-12, that will be voted in Parliament, and they want a net uh, a zero emission in uh, 2050. So, so that's a bill that the Trudeau government is presenting in front of the government, and it will be vote in front of the parliament, sorry, and it will be vote. But don't forget that the Paris Accord, it's not a mandatory accord. You know, a lot of other countries like China or India they didn't have any legislation, they didn't do anything to fight climate change. But Trudeau is going further, is going more in deep. And he said, you know, I believe in climate change. I believe that we must do everything and also hurting the economy to fight climate change. And he's going uh, up to table a legislation in from the parliament saying that the government of Canada will have uh, zero uh, carbon emissions uh, before uh, or before or at uh, 2050. So that's coming from the UN, that's coming from another organization, but that's the Trudeau government who decided to put that in legislation. So what I'm saying, yes, the global reset, the reset can have an impact in Canada. And if you look at the conservative, they believe in climate change, so they may vote in, vote in favor of this bill. We'll see. But that, uh, it's... Uh, it's all, you know, there's no uh, deep state. You know, the deep state is the civil servant working for the government, working for a department, for a minister. They, they speak with each other in different jurisdictions and they propose, they propose policies to their minister or to the prime minister. And it's, uh, you have to elect the right people. If you don't believe in that, you don't vote for it. 
but I'm very concerned because of the conservatives and the liberals playing the same game. Uh, it will have a huge impact on our prosperity and our freedom. So that being said, uh, the, the, the reset is there, but I'm more concerned about the reality of Canada and, and the government of Canada that is adopting these uh, kind of policies. I, I'm just pulling this chat up here. I almost fell out of my chair when I heard Jason Kenney say Klaus Schwab's book, The Great Reset, was sent to him and every premier in Canada. Kenney disavowed The Great Reset for Alberta. Amen. And I sort of, like, I don't believe in these conspiracy theories, and I'll, maybe we'll talk about one in a bit about this, you know, leaked email that's circulating. But when I saw François Legault tweet that he read about the fourth industrial revolution by Klaus Schwab, I'm like... If they don't want people to believe these theories, maybe they shouldn't be tweeting out, you know, that they are reading about the fourth industrial revolution by the founder and president of the World Economic Forum. Um, but it, so, I mean, it's an interesting thing because like people call it a conspiracy theory, and others are just going to say it's policy. You know, Trudeau is quite open with the policy. You know, yeah. he believes in climate change, and not that you have to deny climate change to not support some of the policies that he's putting forward. This is where Maxime, you know, ça pourrait être un problème de langue quand on dit. Uh, you know, quand on dit ou quand vous dites quelque chose comme uh, il croit dans le, de, dans le climate change, he believes in climate change. And so someone is going to take that clip and say, oh, look, Maxime says Trudeau believes in climate change, which means that he doesn't. I, I think on the one hand, people can mm, believe in no. climate change without necessarily believing in all of the policy that is being implemented. Because but, I, I looked it up, yeah. I start looking into it. China, but China the producer, US and Canada wants to cripple its economy to eliminate its, its its emissions, which are negligible on the global scale, but you know not negligible on the per capita of our 33 million population. What's that going to do to a country? Yeah, but what I'm saying is believing in climate change. I believe in climate change. The climate is always changing. What I'm saying is believe is believing uh, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals in a uh, made made uh, climate change. So they, they they think that the impact on climate is 100 percent because of humanity. So, you know, uh, I, I was listening to uh, Patrick Moore, that is a, 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 the co-founder of Greenpeace, and now, you know, is, uh, he, work, he is uh, an independent uh, environmentalist, and the climate is always changing. We, we can agree on that, but I don't agree to have policies that will hurt the economy to try to change the climate by 2% and saying that it's all because of industrialization of, uh, of our economy. No, there's other factors. And, and they are saying that CO2 uh, is um, a very bad gas. No, CO2, it's, it's important for life. I said that publicly. It, it, it's food for plants. And, and I'm, I'm speaking to you right now. And, uh, and that CO2 is coming out of my mouth. So CO2 is not poison. It's a lie that is very important for life. But, you know, they all put that on CO2 and man. And so uh, man is, uh, we, we, the industrial, industrial revolution was bad because of uh, uh, CO2 and the impact on climate uh, you know I, i'm not uh, i'm not drinking that cool egg uh, and actually this brings me back or this reminds me of another thing for which you took some flack where you made fun of greta or you didn't make fun of you actually just stated overtly that you think she has um you know she suffers from mental conditions and is in a state of perpetual panic and is trying to propagate that panic among children and the rest of the world and you took a lot of flack for that and you know, I read I read the tweets tweeting tweeting anything negative about Greta uh, Thunberg uh, is uh, is like insulting Celine Dion or Jeremy Gabriel. It's one of those things you can't do it on the global scale, and that was something that didn't work well for your for your PR. But um, let's see here. Yeah, uh, but but at, but at least people I think understand that um, you know uh, I'm against uh, that history of climate change. Well, I mean, people can disagree with you, but at the very least, they're going to know and, and people can look up what it is, in fact, that uh, the Trudeau government wants to do to the Canadian economy to pursue this goal and what it's going to do to us uh, and what it's going to do to us. Whereas, and everyone knows it, it's not a secret either that China is not going to implement any such economical crippling policies. So it's it's very nice that we're financing the biggest polluter in the world. Um, yeah. What was I just about to ask you? Oh, hold on. I'll get, I'll get, I'll get one more question. I'll be, not one more, but I'll get a bunch of questions that I haven't gotten to yet. Maxim, it was. Yeah. 
Does Mad Max believe that the MSM conspired to silence populist-driven politicians because they fear another Trump? Well, you know, uh, I think it's a fact. It's a fact that, uh, you know, the mainstream media are not covering what the People's Party of Canada is saying and what we have to say. Um, you, and we want to uh, engage in real debates in this country. Like I said, uh, the speech that I delivered last weekend uh, in Alberta about radical decentralization, I think it's important for the future of this country. It's important for the unity of this country, but also the prosperity of this country. But that being said, Said. I didn't have any coverage from the mainstream media. So uh, that's a fact right now that they're, they're not covering. And the, on, the only time that they will cover me, I think, or, or the, the, the People's Party of Canada, it is when uh, they think that uh, something that I'm seeing will hurt a little bit more the conservatives. So because I think they are pro, uh, more pro-liberals. So uh, they, 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 they may cover me uh, when they think that what I'm saying will hurt a little bit uh, the conservatives. But actually, <laughs> that's what, what I'm saying. I'm putting the conservatives and the liberals in the same basket. They're the same on a lot of policies, like I said in the beginning. But the fact is, yes, the mainstream media um, uh, is not covering uh, what we are doing right now. Well, I mean, they, yeah, they, they cover you when they when you say something that they think is offensive that they can demonize, and 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 they cover stuff that is offensive that some people in your party might have said, and that uh, you know they say no 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 press is bad press, but um, I, I I recall in 2018 the press that the People's Party of Canada was getting, and uh, knowing what I know now about the mainstream media, it causes me to question things a lot more now. Uh, let Absolutely. me bring up David Van Am. No, it's, it's, it's crazy. But David Van Am says, can you speak about Section 15B of the Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms? Humber College, who has created eight times 20 uh, scholarships only for students who identify as Black, African, Indigenous, and or racialized person. Actual quote from Page. I, yeah. I, I can so, feel the, I think about that. Yes, first of all, uh, all the, these uh, grants and, and subsidies uh, that are targeting a group, I call that uh, pandering to a group, uh, a special interest group. Uh, we are doing politics for every Canadian, for all Canadians. So we will abolish all these kind of programs. There's another program also for uh, black entrepreneurs or, 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 or women entrepreneurs. So, so we don't need that. We, need a, a, we don't need these kind of programs that target uh, special uh, groups in, a, in our society. Uh, the Trudeau government is very efficient at doing that. And at the same time, freedom of, on campus and free expression of ca on campus, it's very important. And uh, uh, we have a policy on that. If a university uh, wants to have a, a grant or a, a subsidies from the federal government, they will have to have a free speech uh, policy uh, for, for for their campus. I think it's very important. Um, I, I actually, so I mean, I want to ask you the broader question because I, I my I know that my crowd is definitely more conservative, more libertarian. I, I know it. I think I have five or ten percent liberal. Uh, so they're listening to you. They probably agree with you. I mean, I, I think a lot of what you're saying makes sense in general. I. My only thing is knowing the way the media works, I phrase everything I would say publicly in a manner that would be very difficult for the media to uh, hold against you and demonize you as racist, xenophobic, and whatever. But sometimes it's, it's impossible to do that. But for those who agree with you and like what you, and, you, know, like what you say, but they see you, you're going to be polling at best. I mean, at best, they can hope that you have, what, 4 or 5% in the next election when it happens. What do you see happening to Canada now? I mean, and what do you see happening where... It's been a year now, uh, $2,000 a month to everybody who's been locked out of their job, who, uh, what good's that money going to do when they come off and have no job to go back to? Small business loans of 40000 10000 of which is forgivable. From what I understand, there's a real risk that a lot of these companies that took the 40000 loan are going to go bankrupt and pay none of it back. Uh, a crippled economy. What are we going to come back to and what does the future of Canada hold in the near to long, you know, in the in the short to long term? Are we are we are we done for in a way, or or can we come back from this? 
I, I think, uh, you know, I'm a, a real uh, optimistic. I think at the end, yes, we will. But, uh, you know, it's it's very tough right now and it can be tougher in the near future because of these deficit, because of these, yes, you're right, $2,000 a month that the federal government is giving to people instead of reopen the economy, uh, the huge deficit. Uh, and also, we, uh, the other politicians, don't want to have the discussion that will have an impact for uh, the, the, the real discussion that uh, we are having right now because all these uh, decisions will have an impact on our future generations. So yes, uh, we are having a tough time and it can be tougher. That's why, you know, I think it's time to speak the truth and, and telling the things like they are right now. Uh, and that's what we are doing at the PPC. Maybe people won't like to hear that. And we maybe have uh, not, a, 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 not a huge support at the end. But you know, from 1.6%, I think we can grow our support for five, uh, four, five, six percent. I don't know. We can have uh, some of candidates that would be elected. And I assume that we have one person back in parliament we will be able to influence the debate. They will have, the mainstream media will have to speak about us. We can have a parliamentary a commission on, on different subjects that we can bring. And so that's so important, the next election for the PPC. We need to do our best to grow uh, our base and and we are but we must uh, we must admit that we are there for the midterm and the long term. Uh, uh, until our policies are 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 adopted by by the government or by the PPC government, I'm not say telling to people that I'll be prime minister after the next general election, but I'm telling people that I believe that today the PPC will have a huge influence in Canadian politics, and that can start just after the next election. All right, we've got Jason McConnell who always asks actually in you know on point questions, thought on the notwithstanding clause. Now, I don't want to. I don't want to mischaracterize the notwithstanding clauses in the Constitution, but uh, I might do it. It basically means that the government can suspend. Um, unco well, it can suspend the Constitution for up to what is it, two or three years? If it's in a, if we're in a state of emergency or something. Yeah, they, they can suspend the, the the Charter of Rights, the section in the Charter of Rights. Uh, provincial government can pass a legislation and said. Uh, now I'm sending the Charter of Rights or individual rights. Uh, I'm passing that legislation and they will have to renew that. And I don't remember, but yes, there's a time limit for that. I don't remember if it's three years or five years, um, but uh, that's the, the the goal of that uh, of that clause. Clause. I mean, and now the question is, uh, what can you do? What can any minority party in government or opposition party in in government do now, if the government, if Trudeau publicly declares he's not having the, the discussion about uh, the Constitution now, and we're going to implement quarantine hotels, we're going to potentially implement a vaccine passport, potentially implement mandatory vaccines. I mean, I don't think that's on the table yet, but with the slippery slope that we've been seeing over the last year, I think it might be only a matter of time. I mean, what, what can any opposition or minority party do to any of this? Or nobody's really objecting to it in government except the PPC. I think the last is the right. Uh, nobody in Parliament are opposed to that. Uh, actually, right now, you know, uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, the, the, the politician and government, we, at that time, it was very important to limit the power of the uh, government and uh, having limited government. Uh, that was written in a constitution, in our constitution, in the US constitution for sure. But we had that. And now uh, the, the Trudeau government and, uh, is not respecting our constitution anymore with the lockdowns. And uh, you have a lot of example of that. If they impose mandatory uh, vaccine, they, they, they don't respect the constitution right now. They the liberals. And, and you have that. So uh, yes, we have a nice constitution, but the, we must have the courage to speak about what we don't like to be sure to preserve our rights and freedoms. And that's what we are doing. So that's why it's so important to have a voice. And I think, I think Canadian, Canadians need 
Canadians need our voice, the PPC voice over there, because we're the only one who, will, who is fighting for the Constitution, who is fighting for individual rights and freedoms. So what answering your question, what we can do right now, but I think you, you can be, be part of the BBC and, and help us to fight. We're the only one who's fighting against uh, uh, centralizations and, uh, and authoritarian governments. Well, I, I prefer to remain politically unaffiliated and just promote the message that I think. The, the funny thing is, we've literally gotten to a point where you're called conservative if you're anti-lockdown. And you're called uh, selfish if you're anti-lockdown. I, I, you know, from the beginning, you know, the, the two-week lockdown, uh, begrudgingly accepted it out of necessity, and then you know, questioned more and more. And the longer it goes, the more I question. And it just and and the way the media works is that it's just anybody who questions is branded a conspiracy theorist, far right, alt right, whatever. Uh, whereas. All that, that's a long way of saying like, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not politically affiliated. My mess, some of what I say happens to align with some of what you say. Uh, and yeah. that is my, the, the way I've evolved over the last year seeing this. I remember having the discussions about, you know, mandatory masks. And I said, I think, I, I think everyone should wear the mask, but the government should not impose it because it leads to problems X, Y, and Z. It leads to citizens arrest, violence, intolerance. It leads to the the perceived moral uh, authority of citizens to rat out other citizens, whereas I think you'd get you'd get ninety some odd percent participation if it weren't illegal. But it's the stepping stone. Then it becomes legal, and now it's a question of curfew, and people yeah. don't question it. And, and I don't I, I don't know where it ends as an individual, but it's it's interesting to hear you talk about it. Um, I had one more question. Well, not I had a bunch of more questions, but I don't know <laughs> if we can get to them all. Uh, Oh, what do you say? This is from Stefan Pinel, who says, what do you say to Canadians who point out that the PPC does not have a party constitution? Well, first of all, we have people who are coming to the party. They know the platform. We have a strong platform and we're not like a, a traditional establishment political party that um, uh, is uh, that they're changing their platform at every, every election. We have a strong platform. We are an official political party uh, approved by Election Canada. We are we are a real political party. Yes, the question of the constitution of the party, because we're doing politics differently, because we are a, 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 a smart populist political party, we need to do our things differently. And now we are doing it. We are in the process to do an amalgamation of our riding associations all across the country. We had before the last election 338 riding associations. That's organizations in every riding. So we need, uh, and at the end, you know, it was not so efficient. We'll have more regional uh, riding associations. So we are in the process to doing that. That will end at the end of this month. And the same thing of the selection of our candidates. All of that, it is part of a constitution in details. So we don't know what is the best organization for us right now. As soon, and we are learning because we're a new populist party, but as soon as we'll know how to have organization on the ground that is the more efficient, it will be part of our constitution and we'll have a constitution. But at the end, it's uh, it, 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 we it's only a document that uh, we have everything. And in that constitution, you'll have also a leadership review from the leader and things like that. That will come. But I must admit, our focus right now is to rebuild the party. Because a lot of our candidates that uh, was with us at the last election, some of them will stay, maybe 50% of them. Others will do other things. So we need to find candidates. We need to build these uh, regional writing associations all across the country. That's our priority. And after that, we will uh, work on the constitution for sure. Okay. What's your The website is peoplespartyofcanada.ca? Peoplespartyofcanada.ca. You're right. Okay. And now... Someone had asked, and it's a question that I've been asking because I don't consider myself conservative. I just know a smart politician when I see one. And when I saw Pierre uh, Poilievre perform over the last year or two, I said, this is, a, this is a very promising politician. From what I understand, too young to run for leadership, has a young family and doesn't want to. Uh, from what I also understand, was demoted by O'Toole. Is he, is he a potential... A, you know, able to be acquired by the PPC, or he's uh, going to stay where he is. 
Well, I know Pierre personally. You know, I was sitting with him when I was a conservative. And you're right, uh, Pierre is the only conservative in the Conservative Party of Canada right now. But you're right also, uh, he has been demoted. Uh, he has a demotion by the leader because he was too conservative and O'Toole uh, wants to uh, be a liberalite. And he said, you know, his goal is to split the liberal the liberals vote. So he's doing that right now. Uh, uh, answering your question, I called uh, Pierre Poliev uh, and I, I tweeted about that. And I said, Pierre, uh, I left a message. He didn't answer uh, my call, but I, I left a message in his voice uh, mail. And I said, Pierre, you will come uh, uh, to the PPC. We are sharing the same values. And here you'll be able to speak about what you speak. Uh, but he didn't answer, and uh, I think that he's going to stay in the with the Conservative Party of Canada. Um, so I wish him uh, good luck. Uh, but at the end, the Conservatives, their role and what they want is to be elected, and they'll do everything to be elected. They don't have any convictions. And we at the PPC were doing politics based on, on conviction and passion and speaking about the real issues, like I said. Um what is this is another question from Iblis Shaitan says, hey, Max, what is the PPC stance on nuclear energy? Every other party seems to have either no stance on nuclear or aim to shut nuclear plants down. Does PPC have any particular policy on that? No, we don't have a, a, part, a particular policy on that. We may have one, but uh, I'm not against it. You know, uh, I think that it's a good energy. Uh, we're not against uh, uh, the nuclear energy or the oil and gas energy or the hydroelectricity energy, uh, you know, uh, but that will be uh, developed by the private sector. So uh, we won't have a policy against the nuclear energy in Canada. I, I think that uh, you have a point there. Uh, that's an energy that is uh, uh, safe and, and also clean that uh, can be promoted here in this country. I'm seeing some chats in the chat section, which we'll we'll get to maybe in a bit. Uh, firearms. I don't even know uh, what's what. The, <laughs> first of all, what, what is what is PPC? What do you think about uh, Trudeau's order in council uh, issued in the midst of this pandemic? And what is the PPC's policy on? firearm rights in Canada? Well, first of all, it's uh, far, firearms rights. It is property rights, and people must, must understand that. And uh, it will re we will repeal all that. We have a policy that is uh, clear on gun, and I'm asking people to go on our website. It's there, peoplespartyofcanada.ca. Uh, that being said, uh, everything that the Trudeau government is doing it is. Uh, it, it, it won't. It won't serve anything. It's. Uh, it's against our freedom. And yes, we'll repeal that. And I think Canadians. Uh, you know, if you want to have a gun in this country, there. There's some. You need to do uh, an exam. You need to uh, ask your wife to sign if she has, or, or your husband if she, if he or she, he if he or she agrees. With, uh, with you having an arm. So there's a lot of things to do. But all that classification of our arms that is, be is being done right now by the RCMP, I think it must be the role of the members of parliament to vote that. So we have a details policy on gun, and I think that's the best one. Uh, but uh, answering your question, we won't, uh, we will, uh, we, we won't do what the Trudeau government is doing. We'll, we will repeal all that and, and come back with a legislation that respects our property rights in this country. I, mean, I guess the other question is, how do you even go about doing that when you... It's, it's an interesting thing. Who in the general population is going to look kindly on a politician like yourself who's going to say, I want to eliminate gun laws? It sounds like... It, it seems like we're already at a point where that is not going to be acceptable to the vast majority of Canadians, uh, except to those who may already, um, say, been more informed on gun laws and gun stuff in general. How do, how do you get that uh, to anybody? I mean, who, who's going to accept it? Yeah. Yeah, but I, I'm not saying that that will eliminate a uh, gun law. We, we have we'll have a legislation on gun like we had in the past, but that won't be that legislation that the Trudeau government just passed. Uh, and, and our goal as politicians is to explain the legislation. And you know, uh, the problem usually is not the gun; it's the person behind the gun. So you must do uh, more uh, when a person 
wants to have a gun, I think that the RCMP must uh, do a more uh, uh, in deep investigation on that person. But right now, they don't have the money for doing that. The Trudeau government is not focusing on that. So we'll have a gun law, but that that law will respect property rights and, and the fact that uh, gun owners are not criminals. Well, it, it is it, having done some of the research myself, and I took I took the firearm safety course in Quebec, a two day course. You have to pass an exam, yeah, and then yeah. a number of other things, which to Americans is absolutely unheard of. But when you realize that, I mean, I don't, I, what is it, eighty five percent of gun violence in Canada is committed with, on the one hand, illegal firearms and firearms that are already highly restricted in uh, owning a a, 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 a small arm. Is, is the most regulated thing in Canada already, and yet that's what the majority of gun crime is committed with, and illegal ones at that. So, I, again, I, you know, I, I when I saw Justin Trudeau issue the order in council banning, what was it, 1,400 long arms, yeah. whereas anyone who already knows what the issue of gun violence is in Canada would know that that's not just counterproductive, it's just, it's, it's totally irrelevant, uh, but it looks good on paper and the media runs with it and says, we have a, we have a, a, a prime minister who's tough on guns. But I, I do, I feel that the public sentiment is, is already so far to one side that even, even what you're trying to explain now will be ill-received and will be misrepresented by the media. But, you know, uh, it, I can see the same about our, our, our policy on climate change. We are saying that we won't do anything at the federal level on climate change. We'll, we'll do something for the environment. We need to have clear lakes, clear rivers. Uh, we can do something. But uh, climate change, uh, we'll let that to provinces because the environment, it's a shared jurisdiction with provinces. So if they want to do something, like in Quebec, for example, uh, the Justin Trudeau's government is not imposing a carbon tax on Quebec because they have their cap and trade system. So, so uh, it, it's something that you have explained, to, you have to explain to Canadians, and that's what we are doing. Uh, we'll do the same thing with our foreign guns policies, uh, policy and other policy that we have. Um, but that's what I said in the beginning. When you have only 20, 25 percent of support on one policy, we believe that we more we must speak about it more often to have more support because we believe it's a right policy for the country. So we're, we're not afraid to speak about something that uh, we don't have the majority right now. It's not because that you don't have the majority that a policy is not a good one. Uh, you know, you need to be out there and to speak about that policy. And that's what we will do. And that's what all our candidates will do at the next election. election. All right. And now I think we'll maybe we'll, we'll, I don't want to keep you for too long, but one question, which two questions there intertwine. Uh, what's your feeling about the Wexit movement? And um, how do you how do you reconcile, if you ever had the opportunity, how do you reconcile the sentiment of the West with with Canada as a whole? Well, first of all, we we must acknowledge that uh, there's uh, Western alienation and there's people in, in Alberta and other provinces that want to separate. Uh, there's no uh, leader at the federal leaders at the federal level who acknowledge that. So we are at the PPC first. Second, like I just said, I was in uh, Alberta uh, last uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And so I had a discussion about that. And, you know, for the unity of this country, we have the best policy. Uh, radical decentralization, respecting the Constitution. And I think people out West, if you have a government that will respect the Constitution, that will give more autonomy to provinces, that was the wish of our fathers, uh, the fathers of our Constitution. Uh, more than 100 years ago. So, but now, like we said during that conversation, uh, the federal government is not respecting the constitution. And so we have to go back to, the constitution is not a document that can change every uh, every decade. It's a document that is there and, and you must you must follow that document and we are not right now. So to be sure to keep the unity in this country, we, uh, we must give more autonomy to provinces. And I think people in Alberta, they want to have their own police force. They want to have their own case, the depot, pension plan, 
plan. They want to, uh, to uh, have their own environment policy. They want to be able to select uh, their immigrants. Uh, every, all that, Quebec is doing that right now. So the other provinces can do the same thing, can, can, can take the, these uh, actions to, to have more autonomy. But at the same time, at the federal level, we must not interfere in healthcare, in education, in uh, local infrastructures. So we, we have a plan and we are, we are the only party who have a plan to fight uh, against uh, the Western alienations and for a more united uh, country. So I'm encouraging people to go and read that speech that I just delivered last weekend. It's on the website, it's called Radical Decentralization. That's the solution for a more prosperous and united country. All right, and Mr. Robertson07 says, very late getting here, PPC sounds too close to CCP, which is the Communist uh, Communist Party. Well, Communist Chinese Party. Uh, think maybe a name change is in order. I must say, I had the same reflex at one point in time. Um, mm. Okay, everybody in the chat, let's see, if I, if I didn't hit any of your questions, I notice some people are complaining that I'm not asking some hard questions. If anybody has any more difficult questions for Maxim, get him in the chat now and I will bring him up. Let me just see what I can say here. Uh, give yeah. me one second. I'm going to try to bring up a couple more comments. Um, well, we got, I'll, I'll take up the flattery one. David, you are doing a very good interview. Very informative. Thank you, Max, for your honesty. The um, Maxime, is there, any, I mean, is there anything else you want to leave us with? If uh, anything else we haven't touched on that you want to get out to people and maybe I can cross-examine you on it for a few minutes. Yeah, so, so, so what I'm saying to people, you know, some people are saying, you know, uh, Maxime, maybe you won't be in government uh, and uh, voting for you, it's uh, wasting our vote. I want to answer that. It is not wasting your vote. I'm asking you for the first time to vote for what you believe in, to vote for something instead of voting against something. And look, you know, uh, I don't, I, we're doing politics differently. I don't try to appeal to your emotions like uh, other uh, political parties and political leaders. I try to appeal to your intelligence. And yes, we are a populist party, but we're doing smart. Uh, politics, uh, go on our website, read our platform. It's all based on these four principles. If you believe in this country, if you believe that we must have a smaller government in, in Ottawa that will respect property rights, that will respect your freedoms, that won't interfere in provincial ju jurisdiction, uh, that uh, will fight against cancel culture and our free speech and our freedom, we are the only party at the federal level. And if you support us, if you support us, we will grow, and, and, and we'll have will grow, and and we'll will be able to participate in the national debates because it's so important. Like I said, you need our voice in Ottawa, so help us to help you, and, and we will win. You just have to look at politics in a different way, uh, and, and if you uh, if you think that the conservative. Um, uh, are the solutions. They are not. Look at their platform and they're like the liberals. So we are the only real uh, free markets, uh, classical liberals, if I can express myself like that, conservatives, alternative in this country. We need your support to grow and, uh, and also to have a couple of uh, candidates being elected in parliament at the next general election. If you're interested, go on our website, People's Party of Canada, let's see, you can become a candidate. You can help us to build an organization in your writing. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, I don't know, David, if you have a tough question, but I'm ready for every question. Right. Let me see here, arms, I, I like this question. Arms production in Canada, will the PPC continue to send arms to Saudi Arabia? Uh, first of all, Yes, it's a good question. We don't have a, a, a policy, a written policy on that. Uh, we must look at it. I think that uh, if you, uh, what will be, it's a, I'm thinking about it right now uh, and I'm not uh, doing a policy, but we, we must look at it. I think we must question that. Maybe we must have a, 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 a debate or, or, or a, a parliamentary commission that will look at all that. Maybe it's not only Saudi Arabia. Maybe we are sending arms to other uh, dictature that we must not. I think I'm open to have the debate. And uh, frankly, uh, I don't have the solution, uh, but personally, I think I'll be a little bit more against it, but I want to have more, uh, more facts and more details about who's buying our arms 
all across the world uh, and looking at that. So answering the question, we don't have a policy on that and we uh, are open to have uh, more details. And if you want to submit something to us, go on our website if you have an ideas, uh, info at People's Party of Canada and, and submit us uh, an ideas about that or, or a draft policy about that. All right, we got Dr. Can't read it. Question, we electoral reform for radical decentralization. Also, no more vote splitting. What are your thoughts? Well, we don't need electoral reform uh, for a radical decentralization because, like I said, it's based on respecting our constitution. We can do that without reopening the constitution, without reinterpreting our constitution. Uh, you can do it. Uh, it's like uh, the equalization formula. Uh, people think that we need to have a big discussion for reviewing the formula, being less generous, giving the right incentives to provinces uh, by changing the formula and being less generous. You can do that by one meeting, one cabinet meeting at the federal level, a, a decision uh, from the government with no consultation. So the radical decentralization, it's something that you can do without uh, having to change uh, things, maybe the, the, without having to change the constitution or, or, or rewrite the constitution. But uh, we, need, we need to have that discussion. And I try to have that discussion with other uh, parties, but I'm looking at, at O'Toole's and the NDP and the Liberals, they don't want to have a radical decentralization because they think that the federal government must intervene, intervene uh, be uh, present more in your day-to-day -day lives. That's not what we want at the People's Party of Canada. Right. And, and Jason McConnell says, Joe Clark argued for federal decentralization. Every book, magazine, article, etc. published in this country since portrays him as a failure. MSM bias is not new. Here's another. Here's a fun question, uh, Maxim. For or against? But I must. I, but, but I must say about radical decentralization. Yes, it's not new. Actually, Preston Manning uh, spoke about that. It was part of the blue book uh, from Preston Manning from the Reform Party in the 1990s. So it's not new. The fact that we are asking for the government of Canada to respect is its own constitution. Okay. I mean, good enough. Now. Uh, defund the cbc what's your what's your yeah. take on that 100 percent 100 percent the government you know the government must be uh not uh, helping the media the government must not uh, uh, must be independent from the media so all these uh, subsidies will be abolished the one that's for cbc for sure but all the other one that the trudeau government gave to uh, all sort of media if a media is good their people must be able, their viewers must be able to finance it. So yes, we'll, uh, we'll cut and we'll abolish the fundings uh, of, for the CBC. It's about $1.2 billion that we can save there. Is it $1.2 billion a year or is it $1.2 billion amortized over four years? A year, a year. It's, war it's a year. $1.2 billion a year. Um, Okay, here's a, here's one actually I was going to ask. What about Chinese troops in Canada? There are a number of emails going around, uh, allegedly leaked emails. Rebel News did a piece on this. Are there Chinese troops in Canada? Are they training here? Is Justin Trudeau government giving them intelligence on how to fight in winter conditions? Yeah, so actually uh, it's a fact that there's uh, Chinese uh, soldiers that are training here in Canada and because of the Trudeau government wanted that. So we won't do that. Uh, a PPC government will stop all that. We won't help the, the Chinese Communist Party to be more efficient uh, in fighting uh, during winter. Uh, but uh, yes, there are some soldiers that are here and are learning some of our techniques. And I think you must stop that as soon as possible. All right. Um, here, J J John Jalan says, I get paid later this week. Most of my tax is going to the wrong places. Do do um, is there? Do you foresee an increase in taxes? I mean, a lot of people are saying that the government's going to have to increase tax to pay for this deficit. I mean, whether or not they do that, we're seeing the indirect tax via inflation and via cost of goods going up. Do does do you know if the government on the horizon has an increase in tax, a COVID tax, or something to try to make up for this? 
Well, I think we will see in the next uh, in the next budget. But I believe that yes, the Trudeau government will raise some taxes. Uh, but at the same time, that government will want to be reelected. So I don't think that they will have the courage to raise taxes to pay for that uh, huge deficit. Uh, and I think your uh, viewers is right saying that we will all pay by inflation. Inflation is a hidden tax. Uh, you know, instead of the government taking your own money in your own pockets, uh, they won't do that. They will leave you your money in your pockets, but you won't be able to buy the same amount of goods and services with that money. So that's like a tax. And, and that inflation will come. Actually, right now, if you do your grocery, there's about 4% inflation there. But the general inflation in Canada, it's uh, around 2%. I think it will go higher. So that will be a way for the federal government, the Trudeau government, to get away with that, to, to pay back that deficit. For us at the People's Party, we said at the last election that we will balance the budget in two years. Actually, it, won't be, it will be impossible to do that. We will review our platform on that, but we will. We are looking to try to balance the budget in one mandate. Uh, we have to look at all the data, uh, and we are updating our platform on that uh, right now. So, but uh, what we can do, we can stop the uh, uh, the lockdowns and stopping all the grants and subsidies that the Trudeau government is giving to Canadians and businesses, you will save because our deficit is coming from these programs, so you will save a lot. We can, uh, like I said, cut uh, CBC, $1.2 billion. We can cut uh, uh, subsidies to businesses. We can save between 5 and $8 billion. We can, and that's part of our program. We can also uh, stop foreign aids. We can save four billion dollars there. We need to re review all these programs, and we're we are ready to do it. Oh no! I guess we'll, we'll end on this because this is a, a good one to end on. What you're basically describing sounds like Canada first. And so, how are you? Going, how are you going to sell the idea of Canada first to people who are going to qualify it as xenophobic, anti-immigrant, and uh, non-inclusive? I mean, how, how do you how do you frame this? and try to convince people who are going to frame this as being racist and xenophobic that it's not? Or, or, or is it, and, you're, and you don't mind? <laughs> Maybe they will do it, and you're right, I don't mind because it's not true, and I will fight for Canadian first and put our country first. Absolutely, absolutely, I'll do that. And doing that, it's just being patriotic and believing in this country. So if people try to put us in a corner, uh, you know, it, it's not true. And uh, I will fight by saying the truth and saying who we are at the People's Party of Canada. Yes, we don't try to pander to every special interest group. We are speaking for all Canadians and, and, and we don't try to uh, gain votes by uh, divisive our population by different tribes and ethnicity or color of their skin. No, for us, a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. I know that Trudeau said that. But at the end, he didn't believe in that. For us, you know, there's no discrimination, and we must uh, we must work for our Canadian citizen first and putting our country first. That's why we want to cut foreign aids. That once we want to have a, a tax system that would be fair for everybody. That's what. That's why we want to change the equalization formula to be fair for every province. So yes, that will be a part of our of our uh, uh, way to speak to Canadians. Uh, during the next general election. All right, and I think we're going to end it on that because that's a, a perfect place to end it. Um, Maxime, first of all, stick around after so we can say our proper goodbyes. Uh, I want to thank you for doing this. I, I would, so it's clear to everybody, I would have almost anybody on this channel. I would love to have someone from the liberal side come on. They just don't, they don't do it because I ask, you know, I ask questions that I think need to be asked regardless. If it's Dershowitz coming on, I ask the question about the island, you know, I, and I, and I, Grilled Dershowitz about the tough stuff before we got to the you know the other stuff. So it's just some people will not come on. I would love Francois Legault or one of his members to come on and try to explain to the public under reasonable cross-examination that what they're doing is justified. Don't hold your breath, people, but don't accuse me of only hosting the right. Mm -hmm. With that said, uh, tomorrow night live stream with Robert Barnes is going to be Mike Cernovich. Thursday, everyone in the chat talking about free pastor coats. 
We're going to have John Carpe on. John Carpe is not the lawyer on the file, but he's the founder and president of uh, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedom. It's one of their lawyers that's representing uh, Pastor Coates. We're going to talk about that. So tune in on Thursday. I think it's 7.30, but I'll send out the link. Um, and uh, Max, you want, if ever, whenever you want to come back on, we can do this and see what the updates are and see what progress you've made. But uh, last word, so people to reach you, to submit candidacies, where do they go and, and, and what do they do? Yeah, first they can follow me on Twitter, Maxime Bernier. They can follow the PPC on Twitter, People's Party of Canada. Uh, on Instagram also, Maxime Bernier, People's Party of Canada. They can go on our website, peoplespartyofcanada.ca. Uh, they can go on our YouTube. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, uh, the People People's Party of Canada uh, YouTube channel, official YouTube channel. Um, I'm doing some... Uh, uh, videos also there try to do one once uh, once a week uh, so you can follow me there uh, and the most important i think you don't hesitate to go on our website and read our platform and, and like that you will know what we believe in and what we want to fight for we want to fight for you so thank you very much uh, david i was very pleased to be with you that was that was fun you asked the real questions and I, uh, and I'm looking forward to having another discussion with you in the near future uh, when the time will come. Absolutely. All right, everybody. So, Maxime, stick around. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the support, the questions, the chat. And I will see you all very soon.